Give the Father, the Son, and the Spirit of Heaven. Heaven, the King, comfort the Spirit of Truth, wherever our present and close all things. Treasure your blessings and give her of life. Come and abide in us, cleanse us of all stain, and save our souls with your mind. So, um, we are actually drawing really close to the end of St. Paul's epistles. Um, we have the epistle to Titus, and we have the epistle to the Hebrews left. So, rather than try to extend it out and go into Hebrews tonight, because Hebrews really deserves its own attention, much like we did with Romans. So we'll just do Titus tonight. Um, but maybe that'll let us get a little bit more into some of the texts that we, we sometimes do. Um, next time we will do the letter to the Hebrews, and then we just have um, the so-called Catholic epistles, the universal epistles, and the book of Revelation. And we'll have completed our summary of all of the, the books of the scripture. Um, so there's a conversation coming in a couple of months, certainly by the end of the year, for where we want to take the Bible study from here. Right? We did an overview of the scripture, the major themes of the scriptures, the sort of benchmarks of how you make sense and organize the scripture. And then we've been doing our book by book summaries and introductions. Um, and so the next question is, you know, where do we go with this? So um, I'll put that out there, start thinking about what you might find most helpful, most useful out of a Bible study. And in probably a couple of months, we'll have to have that conversation and, and, and figure out where we go from here. Um, so the epistle of St. Paul to St. Titus is pretty short, three chapters, right? And what you'll see is, in many respects, there's a lot of overlap in the basic themes between Titus and the epistles to Timothy, especially 1 Timothy. Um, they're written right around the same time, right? They have the same purpose, which is he... he leaves Titus in Crete, leaves Timothy in Ephesus, and, and now he's writing to these young bishops and giving them instruction on how to organize the church and exercise their ministry. So there are some definite overlap in the themes, although you'll see some differences here um, between Titus and, and Timothy. Okay. Um, we said, this is, you'll recognize this, it's the same slide we used with St. Timothy's this is right. We read the final chapters of Acts. St. Paul is imprisoned in Rome. Um, it seems he was acquitted. And then he's going back to Antioch, which was kind of his main home base for all of his missionary activity. He passes through Crete and Ephesus, leaving these disciples of his, these spiritual sons of his, as these bishops in, in these places. Um, probably visited Colossae and Philippi. Um, and, and then eventually was able to make it all the way to Spain before eventually being arrested again and sent to Rome, okay? Um, and, uh, and as we know, by June of 66, he's, he's beheaded there. Welcome. Um, <clears throat> now, St. Titus, who was he? Well, he was born a pagan on the island of Crete from a prominent family. So he's from Crete, which would explain why St. Paul leaves him there. Um, unlike many of his peers, uh, he was devoted to philosophy and did not give himself over to the evil practices of many around him. St. Ignatius of Antioch, for example, writing right at the, um, the beginning of the second century, testifies that he did preserve his virginity. He receives a dream one night, instructing him to abandon the false teaching of pagan philosophy so he begins reading the prophets, the Old Testament prophets. We know that there are, is a Jewish community on Crete. And so he begins reading the Old Testament prophets, starting with Isaiah, and specifically Isaiah chapter 47. Um, it said is where he kind of picks up, right? Um, which has, among other things, the theme of the gods of the nations or demons, right? That, that, he, that God, Yahweh, the God of Israel, is the only. Um, he then hears about a great prophet who's preaching in Palestine. And so he's actually sent, his uncle was the governor of uh, Crete. And his uncle sends him to go investigate what is this going on in Palestine. 
what's going on in Jerusalem? Go find out. And so he goes there, and that's where he actually sees and meets Christ of the Virgin Mary. Um, He's there in Jerusalem for the death and the resurrection of Christ. He's not yet given himself over entirely to be a follower of Christ, but he's observing what's happening. Okay. Uh, incidentally, the name Titus is a Latin name. It tells you that he ha- he's a Roman. He's a, um, taken on some of the Roman culture. He might even be a citizen in all likelihood, like St. Paul was. There's definitely a, a Latin Roman influence in his family uh, significantly. We know that um, he's actually present in Jerusalem still on Pentecost when he hears the apostles preaching. And we know that one of the languages cited is the Cretan language, right? Um, eventually, though, he is baptized by St. Paul. He accompanies St. Paul on many of his journeys. And then, as we said, he's appointed a bishop of Crete. After visiting St. Paul shortly before his martyrdom, St. Titus returns to Crete, where he died in the church for many years, working many wonders, and died in peace at the age of 97. It's said that his face shone like the sun after his repose. Um, you know, many stories are, are uh, told of him, one, you know, basically through his prayers, casting down the idol of Artemis there in Crete, they were trying to build a new temple for Zeus, and uh, he basically um, orders them all to stop, and basically they stop. Even the pagans like, were afraid of him, and they stopped. Um, they heard his voice of authority. Um, by the way, we hear people like St. Titus referred to as an apostle of the seventy. Now, we know that Christ appointed 70 apostles, right? We read about that. There's the 12, and then there's the 70. Titus is not one of them. Timothy, as we read about, was also, is also described as one of the apostles of the 70. But we know that he doesn't become a follower of Christ until after the fact. Right? There are many others that are like this. So what's going on there? What's going on with that title? We know that many of those 70 apostles abandoned Christ. We read about this, for example, at the end of John chapter 6. Christ teaches about the Eucharist. And many of his disciples and followers leave him. Many of those 70 apostles left, right? Well, in the same way that when Judas betrayed Christ, they appoint Matthias, and he takes his place. Then we have other apostles that come after, like Paul. Um, You have... Various of these early church, Aquila is one, right? Um, you have these various early apostles, the followers of the apostles, that get designated apostles of the 70 as sort of the replacements for those that abandoned Christ after his teaching in the gospel. Does that make sense? So um, it can be confusing sometimes because you read that and you see of the 70 and you think, oh, So he must have been one of the followers of Christ from the very beginning. But then you find out he's never even baptized just for St. Paul. That doesn't seem to make a lot of sense. But this is what's going on. They're seen as, because he's exercising an apostolic ministry, right? He goes to Crete, and as we'll see in a few moments, St. Paul says, go establish, go ordain bishops and priests, right? And so he's exercising this apostolic ministry. Um, and so he's considered an apostle of the 70, kind of taking, taking their place. Um, I should have probably described that earlier. But anyway, Crete, um, aside from having gorgeous, gorgeous beaches, um, as we know, is the largest of the Greek islands. It was the home of the ancient Minoan civilization. Right? We read a lot about this in ancient Greek stories. In biblical times, it was known as a rough place. Many of the the men of fighting age were mercenaries. Um, They were considered untrustworthy people. The word kritizo in ancient Greek, in other words, to act like a Cretan or to be Cretan, basically meant to lie. That's basically what it meant. 
And we know, we saw this elsewhere, right, with, with Corinth, right? To Corinthianize meant to be debaucherous, right? And so um, uh, this was sort of the a thing that happened in ancient Greek culture, whatever the, the trait of a particular place was, would sort of come into the vernacular as a, um, as a type. And, you know, we sort of have geographical versions of that, right? I mean, you know, think of like titles like Redneck, right, or Hillbilly, right? We sort of take, those are really geographic. I mean, even you could say Appalachian, right? Sort of conjures up, for those who aren't from those places, certain images that maybe aren't very flattering, right? Um, I say that as somebody who, when meeting his great-grandmother, asked her, uh, Grandma, where are we from? And she said, I don't, or I said, what, what uh, ethnicity are we? And she said, I don't know, I'm from the holler in Kentucky. Um, so <laughs> a lot of those, apply to my, those epithets apply to my own family. Um, anyway, and then as we see even referenced in St. Paul's epistle, is also a place known for what he describes as sexual corruption. So effectively, he has his work cut out for him, being appointed in, right? Um, so we see at the very beginning, we see this little introduction. And in many ways, it's pretty typical, right? It follows a very standard pattern that we see in St. Paul's epistles. Paul, a bondservant of God, by the way, bondservant is just a nice way of saying slave, right? Rulos is the word. We translate it as servant now because we don't like the connotations of slave because of particularly in a, a, the American context of that word, right? But it really, I mean, even servant, it's funny, right? Servus in Latin means slave. Okay? It doesn't mean like, you know, a butler. It means a slave, right? So we, we try to make it nice. We don't, say sl we don't use slave for dulos or guli. We say servant using the Latin word for slave. <laughs> okay? It's really what it, it's connotated. Um, Paul, a bondservant of God and the apostle of Jesus Christ, according to the faith of God's elect and the acknowledgement of the truth which accords with godliness. Um, right? In the truth which accords with godliness. Knowledge that does not result in change of life is not self-efficient. Acknowledging that Christ is the Savior is nothing if you're not actually living in accordance with that knowledge. Um, I know we Orthodox kind of sit around and nod our head, but those of us from elsewhere understand that's a, a really important point, right? Um, in the hope of eternal life, which God, who cannot lie, promised before time began, but has in due time manifested his word through preaching, which was, by the way, but has in due time manifested his word. Now, if you look in the typical Bible, just about all of them, that word, word there, is not capitalized. And we all think Bible. Did the Bible exist when St. Paul was writing this? Not really. I mean, the Old Testament, right? But the word of Christ, right? Um, and... Right, in due time manifested his word through preaching. So St. Paul manifested the Bible through his teaching? This should be capitalized like we do at the beginning of John. Right? This is the law of Shutheu. This is the word of God. This is Christ. Manifested Christ through his preaching. Right? Um, it doesn't make sense for that to refer to the Bible in this context at all. But that's just sort of how we're wired. And so we just sort of read it and move on and don't really analyze what we're reading. And it shows up, that um, bias, I think, shows up even when you have something like the New King James Version of the Bible writing it and making it lowercase rather than uppercase. Um, uh, 
right? Um, but has in due time manifested his word through preaching, which was committed to me according to the commandment of God our Savior. Um, so we see here too that the message that St. Paul has conveyed to Titus, and which he's then telling Titus to convey, is a message that is rooted in the hope of eternal life. Um, and what's interesting is it says the hope of eternal life which God who cannot lie promised before time began who did God promise it to the point here that he's making is the same as St. John makes in Revelation about the lamb slain from before the foundation of the world this isn't plan B this is plan A you can't force God to change his plan, right? His plan that his son would take on flesh and unite us to himself was plan A from the very beginning. Um, this was his plan before time, before he created us. Um, The, the, maybe the details have changed because of our sin, right, in that sense, although what does foreknowledge even mean with God who's outside of time, right? But, but yes, his plan was to take on flesh. St. Maximus and some of the others have, have talked about this. His plan was to become incarnated, whether or not we sinned, right? That had always been the plan. Exactly, right. There's Right, there's references to this, that, that, that Satan was so envious of the fact that humans, these far more contingent, far more limited beings, would be allowed to participate in the Godhead in a way that angels don't. Um, and, and that seems to significantly contribute to, to his rebellion. You know. um, St. Paul says to Titus, a true son in our common faith, right? There is the spiritual fatherhood. Now we see it, it seems that he has an even more intimate relationship with Timothy in this regard, right? We see this over and over again in the ways that he refers to Timothy. There's a certain tenderness and affection there. But we see it also here with Titus and with others, right? That he is this spiritual father. St. Simeon the New Theologian says, the saints in each generation joined to those who have gone before and filled like them with light become a golden chain in which each saint is a separate link united to the next by faith, works, and love. Isn't that a beautiful image, right? St. Paulus was where expands on this. He says, or the Metropolitan Paulus was where expands on this. He says, you know, there's dual apostolic succession in the church. There's the institutional formal succession of bishop to bishop that maintains the order and the doctrine and the orthodoxy of the church. But there's also this golden chain of spiritual father to spiritual child, right? Passing on the faith, how it is lived in the unique circumstances of each Christian's life, one after the other, generation by generation. And, and this is the piece that's so important. And when we can get so caught up in our debates with, with other ecclesiastical groups about things like apostolic succession, but miss this point too, right? But there's something deeper that's also going on here. Uh, St. Marcinucius of Gaza is an example of a spiritual father. He says, as God himself knows, he's writing to his spiritual children. As God himself knows, there is not a second or an hour when I do not have you in my mind and in my prayers. I care for you more than you care for yourself. I would gladly lay down my life for you. And then in prayer, O oh, Master, even bring my children with me into your kingdom, or else wipe me also out of your book. They're so tied to him that he can't even imagine paradise without them. Um, Dostoevsky refers, he says, a star, it's an elder, 
is one who takes your soul and your will unto his soul and his will. Bring you into this song. And finally, this is a quote from a anonymous uh, author of mine. The spiritual father does not need to be some kind of clairvoyant elder. Rather, he is someone to whom you can open your heart. There's often a mutual recognition that this is my father and this is my son. Or at least that this is a person with whom I want to work out my salvation. Right. Um, what makes a person your spiritual father is that you are their spiritual child. And that there is this mutual love. Right? That is where the grace of God is acting. Um, I know a priest who commented that what changed in his ordination was that whereas before his brother and sister Christians were around him and he loved them and he appreciated them and so on. But at the moment of his ordination he could feel them descending into his heart. And that every day of his priesthood he carries them around with him in his heart at all time and he can't separate them from his heart. Um, this is spiritual fatherhood. Um, <clears throat> at the same time, though, there were false teachers that St. Paul was warning against. By the way, this line that he makes, God who cannot lie. Why did he say that? Right? Remember, Zeus was thought to have been born on Crete. And anybody who's read anything of the mythology of Zeus knows Zeus is not trustworthy. He's a liar. He deals underhanded with people. He tricks people all the time to get what he wants from them. Right? Um, and so he's made, this is a little dig at Zeus saying, our God is not like the Cretan God. Um, and he points out that there were too many teachers there who were of the Jewish community. This is the point, right? He refers to these leaders, these teachers, who are of the circumcision. So we know that there's a Jewish community there on, on Crete. They were insisting on following the circumcision while also blending the faith with false Greek teaching. Right? There's this false teaching, this blending that's going on. Of On the one hand, you have to follow the Torah. You have to be circumcised and follow all the food laws, etc., 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 and at the same time, there's this weird kind of syncretism that seems to be creeping in. Okay? So St. Paul is saying, watch out for all of this. Be careful and, and lead people away from this. What is the solution to that? Well, it's a point good presbyters and bishops, right? Um, and, and what is the thing, right? For this reason I left you in Crete, that you should set in order the things that are lacking, and appoint elders in every city as I can manage you, presbyters, right, and priests. Um, so already, this is, why did I send you there? To organize and structure the church by ordaining priests, right? So those who say that the church couldn't possibly have been organized that early, and the organization and the priestly orders that we've instituted somehow came later in time, that, I mean, that's exactly why Titus is there, right? Set everything in order by ordaining good presbyters. Right? And we see many of the same qualities listed here as we saw in 1 Timothy. Right? If a man is blameless, the husband of one wife, having faithful children, not accused of dissipation or insubordination. Um, to remind my children of that more often, right? Don't be insubordinate, <laughs> otherwise I can't serve anymore. <laughs> um, similarly, for a bishop must be blameless as a steward of God, not self-willed, not quick-tempered, not given to wine, not violent, not greedy for money, but hospitable, a lover of what is good, uh, sober-minded, just, holy, self-controlled, holding fast the faithful word as he has been taught, that he may be able by sound doctrine both to exhort and convict those who contradict. Right? So, how can he exhort and convict those who are sinning? 
with his preaching, with the preaching of sound doctrine, only if he is living in this way. If he is not self-willed, right? He's humble, blameless, not quick-tempered or um, right, given to wine, violent, etc. Right? We have to be living that way so that we can preach from some kind of authority. It's the the um, I know many I know many clergy who after preaching, find themselves praying, Lord, forgive me for my hypocrisy. Right? Because um, we don't necessarily live up to all of this, and yet we're called to preach and exhort. Right? Um, but again, correct doctrine is nothing without living the faith, without living that doctrine and allowing that doctrine to change who you are. Right? Knowledge and belief are nothing without the action and the life that goes with it. Um, and again, even, right, isn't it interesting, even in this situation where he's talking about whom to ordain, when you zoom out, you see this point from St. Paul so clearly, faith without works is dead. St. Paul clearly is in accord with St. James over and over and over again. Sound doctrine does not exhort unless you're living the life of that doctrine. Um, yeah, yeah. yeah. Um, uh, St. Titus lived to be 97. Mm -hmm. Correct. Do, do you know his age about the time that he's being left in Crete by... I don't exactly, so this is probably, you know, he's probably, I'm going to guess in his, I mean, if this is the 60s, you know, he's probably up there, right? So probably in his 70s, I'm going to guess. No, I'm sorry, 30, no, 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 I'm sorry. It would have been, I think he's in his 40s at this point. Um, I think he would have been his 40s probably. Um, I think St. Timothy was a little bit younger. So heck, um, for 50 years he was... Yeah, for quite a while he was there. He was Bishop of Crete. Mm -hmm. Right, right. Yeah, I think he's a late... I think he's in his late teens by the time he goes to see Christ and around oh. 30, 33 AD, somewhere in there, right? So, um, however that works out, probably somewhere in his you know, late 40s, something like that. <coughs> Um, yeah. So then St. Paul goes on in, in chapter um, 2, or this is chapter, yeah, chapter 2, um, to give instructions, in a sense, to the household of faith, right, to the, to the others who are there. As for you, speak the things which are proper for sound doctrine, that the older men be sober, reverent, temperate, sound in faith, in love, in patience. The older women, likewise, that they be reverent in behavior, not slanderers, not given to much wine, teachers of good things. That they admonish the young women to love their husbands, to love their children, to be discreet, chaste, homemakers, good, obedient to their own husbands, that the word of God may not be blasphemed. Likewise, exhort the young men to be sober-minded in all things, showing yourself to be a pattern of good works, in doctrine showing integrity, reverence, and corruptibility, Sound of speech that cannot be condemned, that one who is an opponent may be ashamed, having not the, nothing evil to say of you. Right? So not only exhorting the young men, but then be the example of what it means to be a Christian man. Right? Um, I mean, in my mind, in, in so many ways, isn't he really setting up the pattern of what community life within a parish should be? Right? that those who have lived the faith become the examples then to those who are younger in the faith and being able to show them how to live that Christian faith. I mean, really, we're talking about a model of Christian discipleship, Christian mentoring taking place within the parish, right? Um, and what an amazing thing it would be if within our ministries, right, 
there is this emphasis on essentially that golden chain that we were talking about before being passed on within the parish, within those who are being um, uh, mentored. I mean, I think there is some, certainly a degree of that in every parish, right? There's certainly that. You have conversations at coffee hour and you talk about the faith and somebody brings up, you know, I was, I, there was a shrine to Saint so-and-so and we learned about this and this is the way that we lived and growing up and you, and you pass these things on. Or I've dealt with that too, this is the way that we dealt with it, right? All of those kinds of things within the parish certainly come out, but I think what we're finding even from a ministry standpoint, um, I'll put on my, my hat as a board member of Orthodox Youth Ministries, you know, at OIM, one of the things that we're really finding is that the key to keeping youth engaged is intergenerational ministry. It's not youth ministry, right? And I think you're going to see, it, I know fathers in talks now with Christian Gonzalez, the director of ministry at OIM, to bring a retreat here to this parish this spring. And their retreats now are not youth ministry retreats. They're intergenerational retreats for the parish. Now, the goal is to train all of us how to be youth ministers by being the models and the mentors that young people need, right? Um, but you can't expect that if you just put all the kids over there and have them have their pizza party, or whatever, talk at them for an hour about the faith, whatever you're gonna do, but you put all the kids over there and do youth ministry over there while the, the, us old people are over there, that's not ministry. And that's the model that we've been doing since the 70s, and it ain't working. The retention rates are terrible. And many parts of the Protestant world who came up with this idea in the first place have already abandoned it in large part because they already realized it just doesn't work. We're still kind of clinging, you know, Orthodox moves slow. We were so excited to glob on to this American Protestant ministry model. And now that it isn't working, we say, but that's tradition and that's how we do it. <laughs> right? Um, anyway, God willing, we'll, we'll learn. Um, this is the pattern of parish life and parish ministry. Um, St. Paul goes on, he refers specifically to our great God and Savior Jesus Christ, right? For the grace of God that brings salvation has appeared to all men, teaching us that denying ungodliness and worldly lusts, we should live soberly, righteously, and godly in the present age. Right? Again, what does the grace bring us? The teaching on how to live. Because that matters. Um, looking for the blessed hope and glorious appearing of our great God and Savior Jesus Christ, who gave himself for us that he might redeem us from every lawless deed and purify for himself his own special people, zealous for good works. And one of the, the points that to, to make here is why? Right? Why? Teaching us that denying ungodliness and worldly lust, we should live soberly, righteously, and godly in the present age looking for the blessed hope and glorious appearing of our great God and Savior, Jesus Christ. In other words, we're already participating, we're anticipating the life of the kingdom. We're anticipating his second coming. We're anticipating the life of the kingdom. And that's why we live now as if we are already in the kingdom. Because we're participating. And all of a sudden, that changes a lot of things, right? Why does the church tell us to live in the way that the church tells us to live? Not because it wants laws and it wants to control, but because by doing that we begin to live as if we're already in the kingdom. And not in some dry run way, right? This is not an address rehearsal way. But in a real way we begin to taste and participate in that kingdom. Right? Does that make some sense? That, that this is kind of where, what St. Paul is trying to emphasize here is that we're already looking forward to that second coming. And that's why 
You'll notice in the divine liturgy, when the priest goes to raise the gifts, right, for the, what we call the anonymous, the memorial. So after the words of institution, take ye, this is my body, and so on, and before the calling down of the Holy Spirit for the consecration, what does he say? Calling to mind the cross, the tomb, the burial, the, the resurrection on the third day, his ascension into heaven, and his second and glorious coming, offering to you your own of your own, the hymn of your praise, your request. He refers to the second coming in the liturgy in the same time frame as the death and the resurrection and ascension of Christ. Because in that moment we're participating in all of them. Right? Not just his death and resurrection, but also his second coming. Because to Christ it's all present. Right? And so in the same way, when we um, you know, accept um, the, the, the appearance of Christ, the grace of God, we already, in the present age, we're already looking forward to the blessed hope and glorious appearance. Right? Um, this is making some sense, right? Okay. Um, and what does it bring? brings a new life. St. Paul says, For we ourselves were once foolish, disobedient, deceived, serving various lusts and pleasures, living in malice and envy, hateful and hating one another. But when the kindness and the love of God our Savior toward man appeared, not by works of righteousness which we have done, but according to his mercy, he saved us through the washing of regeneration and the renewing of the Holy Spirit, whom he poured out on us abundantly through Jesus Christ our Savior. That having been justified by his grace, we should become heirs according to the hope of eternal life. So notice he's come back to this hope of eternal life, which is what he started the epistle with, right? He's tying the whole epistle together. Um, the, I point out here, right? Um, according to his mercy, he saved us through the washing of regeneration and renewing of the Holy Spirit, baptism and preservation. So there are, you'll note, you may have read, for example, the Southern Baptists this summer rejected the adoption of the Nicene Creed because they were afraid that anyone who said, I confess one baptism for the remission of sins might be led to think that baptism regenerates us and they reject that doctrine completely, right? They reject the washing of regeneration. Like, how you can read this and not see baptism, right? Especially, I mean, we'll talk about St. Peter where he says baptism saves us quite explicitly. Um, but how you could possibly read this and not see the washing of regeneration being referring, having referred to baptism is beyond me. Uh, but clearly that's what we see here, right? The washing of regeneration, renewing of the Holy Spirit, baptism and preservation, um, whom he poured out on us abundantly through Jesus Christ, our Savior, right? That having been justified by his grace, we should become heirs according to the hope of eternal life. We then receive Jesus Christ, his body and blood, under the remission of sins and life eternal. This, this verse, two verses, I guess, in the epistle to Titus is laying out the sacraments of initiation and elimination. Uh, did the, let's see a redoing of the Holy Spirit. What is that Pouring actually? out of the Holy Spirit, that's chrismation. It's Pentecost. It's our own personal Pentecost. Um, it's also a reference, I think, to Ezekiel, I will pour out my spirit in all flesh, rather than prophecy of Joel. Why is it called renewing, though? Isn't it an initial receiving of Holy Spirit? Well, because man initially had the Spirit breathed into him. And we lost the Spirit in the sin. And now we're, we're being, I mean, yes. I mean, in the same way that we say that we're born again, right? We're, we're on with them. Um, it's sort of this notion but it is. It's a, it's a recreation event. We're being recreated 
the image of God, the image of God in us that was deformed and broken and smudged and white, you know, distorted in sin, is that image is being restored and renewed. Right? We use that language many times in our in our hymns that the the image of God has been um, uh, you know distorted or broken, right? And that image is being restored by the operation of the Holy Spirit. We're regenerated. That means rebirth. Regeneration means rebirth, right? Mm -hmm. We're reborn in the washing and renewed in the, in the Spirit. So that we then, through Jesus Christ, can become a partaker of His grace and hope of eternal life. Does that make some sense? Mm -hmm. what you're saying, right? And this is why we are already um, living in this grace, this regeneration and renewing, right? This is, of course, the, the image of the famous story of St. Sarah from the Seraph, right? Being filled with the Holy Spirit. So much so that his own disciple that's with him, the Tavilog, is talking with him and he sees St. Seraph and begin to glow with the uncreated light of the Holy Spirit. And at some point, St. Seraphim points to him and says, don't you see you're glowing too now? Um, that golden chain that we were talking about earlier, that passing down of the faith, becoming inheritors of that faith, this is the goal of that. This is what it, it leads to. Um, and we see that with St. Seraphim to his spiritual son passing on that grace of the Holy Spirit, right? Um, right? And then that becomes the basis of our missionary activity. Because St. Seraphim says, acquire the spirit of peace and a thousand souls around you will be saved. So the basis of our missionary activity, there's a wonderful little track out there written by an abbot on Mount Athos, um, Theosis, the basis of man's missionary activity. Our missionary activity is not rooted in knowing the truth. It's not rooted, th this is why I have such a problem, <laughs> editing myself. I have such a problem with the online debaters, right? This is a big thing online, Twitter and Twitch and uh, wherever else these people hang out, um, where they do the video debates, right? I'm going to invite you to a debate. We're going to debate about this thing or that thing or another <coughs> thing, right? Um, that's not the basis of our preaching. That's not the basis of our preaching. The Holy Spirit is not present in that kind of proclamation. Right? You can even point to St. Paul on the Areopagus. He does not debate them. Where he's sitting down and you know, engaging with the Epicureans and the Stoics and Cynics in, in philosophic debate. Even though it's, I mean, it's interesting, his epistles are actually chock full of using the rhetorical skills of the philosophers of the day. Um, the Cynics and the Stoics show up quite often. Um, but he doesn't sit down in philosophic debate with them. He proclaims Christ to them. And at least one of them, St. Dionysius, sees in him the truth. Not that he's intellectually converted, but rather that he sees it, right? St. Justin the philosopher is an example of this, right? He's a philosopher and he's going from one philosophic school to the next and he can't find one that fully satisfies him until when? So he's walking on the beach and he comes in contact with a Yerunda, with an elder, who proclaims Christ to him and says, all your philosophy is just as the sand in this, sea, in, in this beach, right? It's Christ. Um, Christ is preached. The, the basis of our preaching is this acquisition of the Holy Spirit. It is this theosis. And we're only as effective in preaching the gospel as we are living this. Only insofar as we ourselves have acquired the Holy Spirit. That doesn't mean that God can't use broken vessels and he can't use 
and effective tools. Um, it also doesn't necessarily mean that we get all, you know, you, you hear the flip side of this, which is also bogus, which is, well, we're orthodox. We don't tell anybody about our faith. We don't really preach our faith. We just sort of live our life and keep our head down in the hopes that maybe somebody will notice how holy we are and come to us and ask us if we, they can go to church with us, right? Well, if that's the case, the church would have never grown because most of us aren't that holy to be noticed that way, right? And usually the people who say that the most are really the people who wouldn't be noticed, <laughs> okay? Um, because they're getting, right, part of our fulfilling the law of Christ and acquiring the Holy Spirit is to, is to fulfill all of his commandments, which includes go into all the nations, teaching them everything that I have taught you, right? Baptizing them in the name of the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit. That great commission, right, is part of theosis. You are not on the path to theosis. I think I can say this uh, as bold as it sounds. You are not on the path to theosis if you are not fulfilling the great commission. It doesn't mean sandwich boards, and it doesn't mean door-to-door -door like a JW. But it does mean that if you have the opportunity to share Christ with somebody and you turn away from them. Right? What does Christ say about the people who, seeing him hunger, do not feed him? Seeing him thirsting, and they don't give him drink. Isn't that even more true of spiritual food and spiritual drink than it is of bread and water? The people around us in the society are starving. They're parched. And they are dying spiritually as a result of it. And if we will not feed them and give them drink, we will be accountable for it. We will be. And that's true not only for us as individuals, but I would challenge us as a parish, always. If we as a parish are not fulfilling the Great Commission. We say all the practice of service in the world, but if we aren't fulfilling the Great Commission, then there's something off in our fulfilling of the gospel as a parish, too. I'm not saying that we don't do that, but we certainly can do better. We all can acknowledge that. Um, so, the basis of it is theosis. It starts with our own personal repentance, our own personal conversion. Um, the practice of service, as I mentioned, right? The divine liturgy, of course, all of these things. This is the basis for our missionary work, but it can't stop there. It can't stop there. I didn't plan on ending there, but thank God. Um, other questions or, or thoughts people have? Yeah. Thank you. At, at one time I was, uh, before chrismation, I was attending the three crosses up the road. Mm -hmm. And uh, I was holding Bible studies at my home, uh, Joanna and I were. <clears throat> and um, I thought I had it all figured out. I read the Bible cover to cover once a year for nine years straight and I thought I had it all going you know but I I found that you know I, I looked into some of the stuff that I was passing on to somebody else and I, I was off base you know I wasn't correct in my my um, my interpretation of what was written what I'm getting at here is that is it something that maybe there should be some schooling because somebody's going to ask you what makes your faith the one mm -hmm. and you you know and you can't go on and say well the other Christian faith is that it's all one thing Jesus Christ and crucified there's right. nothing else and as far as yeah what were you what were about, you know, what the Great Commission is. The gospel is that, you know, mm -hmm. that he died for us. You're right. I mean, you know, St. Peter says that we should have, be ready to give a defense of our faith, right? And um, 
you know, I think, let me put it this way, there is schooling. We have to be willing to accept it. Because the way that we think of schooling is not through apologetics classes. The schooling is come to Orthros and actually listen. The schooling is relate that then to the scripture that I'm reading. The school is sit at the feet of my spiritual father in confession on a regular basis and learn how to live the faith. Right? Read spiritual, read the lives of the saints. Read spiritual writings. Right? Read the fathers. In other words, if we're living the life that the church tells us that we need to live, we'll have that answer. Because what have you heard me say on a number of occasions, right? That the, why do we say the creed is a prayer? Because the creed is not just a checking the boxes of correct doctrine. The creed is a confession of what I as a Christian living in Christ with Christ in me live. I live the incarnation. I live Christ's walking on the earth. I live his crucifixion. I live his descent into Hades. I live his resurrection. I live his ascension at the right hand. I am filled with the Holy Spirit. I have been re regenerated in the washing of baptism, and so on, right? And so, if that's the case, then when the time comes for me to express my faith, I may not have the perfect apologetic words, but I have that life of Christ in me such that I can express what I experience. Right? Um, Titus didn't have the Gospels to read. Right? Titus was appointed as the Bishop of Crete and did not have any of the Gospels to refer to or read. And yet he knew the life of Christ. Both through the preaching of his spiritual father and through the life he lived in Christ. Right? Through that grace that he had received, he was able to confess Christ and teach the true Christ. Um, and so, I mean, yes, we can, I mean, to some extent, that's part of what these classes are about, right? So that we can, we can read the, the scripture in a way where we're reading it with the mind of the church and understand it through that lens. Um, we've done various catechism classes, and we'll do more. Renee is doing her, her class starting next month, which is sort of a, a really good kind of basic catechism class. I mean, one of the problems is that most of us hear catechism, and we say, that's for all the converts, so we don't go, right? But we need to go, because a lot of us haven't really been properly catechized to begin with. Um, Renee is doing this. So there are, there are those educational opportunities available. We have, for crying out loud, things like Ancient Faith Radio. You can listen all day, all 24 hours of the day, every single day, to a new podcast about the faith and probably never run out of material, right? Um, so, but, but fundamentally, right, and we should, we should take advantage of these things, right? Um, I should probably sit and read all the books I buy. Um, <laughs> right. um, on your nightstand. Uh, oh. <laughs> anyway, um, but, but, you know, but fundamentally, all that's nothing. We're not called to be professors, right? Or rather, we're called to be professors. What, what I was getting at was yeah. more of the quick encounter, you know, that yeah. you could say the wrong thing yeah. in one sentence and that didn't even put up. I think, I mean, yes. And that would be an easy thing to instruct, I guess. I think the, the, this is where the role that the monks keep is if we followed it, we won't say the wrong thing. And that rule is don't teach or speak about anything you haven't experienced yet yourself. Mm -hmm. Monks will not properly speak 
or preach about anything in the spiritual life that they themselves have not yet experienced. If we would keep our testimony and confession of the faith to what we've experienced, living this life to the best of our abilities and being strict with ourselves and following Christ, then I think that we don't need to worry about having the right rhetorical flourish or saying the right thing when, we, when somebody asks us about the faith because it's coming from a place of the truth, which is Christ in you. Um, does that make sense? I, I, I think that's the solution to that, right? Because we could be taught all of the rhetorical tools in the world and make zero impact on somebody. But how many times has a pious old lady, maybe it was never catechized in any real way other than what her own mother or grandmother taught her about the faith and what she's learned from her spiritual father and a life in the church, right? Will say the right, say something in love that's simple. It's not fancy, and yet your heart melts. And you see her faith and you say, I want to love Jesus the way she does. That's what we're aiming for. Because they are hungry for Christ. Or rather, if they're hungry for Christ, if they're willing to realize their hunger, they'll see that clearly you um, are well fed. <laughs> sort of like, follow me to the buffet, right? <laughs> um, they'll know this person is drinking from the well, right? St. Fontenay going back to the people of Samaria, right? She didn't understand the hypostatic union. She didn't understand the death and resurrection of Christ yet. All that she knew is, come and see this man who, who told me everything, right? I think he's the one who is to come. And that was enough to change her entire village. Um, anyway, I, maybe I've beaten a dead horse, but no, 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 I, 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 thank you. Any other questions or, or thoughts? Oh, yeah. Uh, I have one that's kind of related. You, you mentioned how St. Paul and St. James are in agreement about uh, the faith without words. Right. Being. The commonly cited verse in, I think it's Ephesians, mm -hmm. uh, in a not of works, lest any man should boast. Mm -hmm. You know, through grace we are saved by faith, not of works. Um, mm -hmm. Is he talking about works of the law there? I mean, maybe this is too yeah. specific. Uh, right. We aren't, right, in other words. I mean, is that just a simple answer? So, so this is the thing. Did we merit Christ? No. Right? We aren't worthy of him in any way. We haven't merited his salvation in any way. But you cannot participate in that salvation without works. Right? And I think that's the, that's the distinction. Yeah, it's not right? our work through which we earn a salvation, but in earning salvation... Yeah, or, or, or even, I don't like earning, right, but it's really more like acquiring salvation, yeah, right? Yeah, yeah. Through, through um, allowing his salvation to be at work in us, yeah. right? Which comes through faithfulness, right? Um, and so, uh, yeah, I think acquisition maybe is the, the, the better. Or appropriation, right, incorporation. You could use all sorts of other words, but um, you know, we're not earning our salvation. We can't do that. We haven't earned anything, right? At the end of our lives, what will we say? I am but an unprofitable servant. I have only done what was given to me to do, right? But that also doesn't mean that you're off the hook and that those works then are just dead and that nothing that I do really has any part to play in that salvation. It's that, um, what is salvation? It is theosis, right? Salvation is being united with God. 
Because otherwise it's not salvation. Salvation is being united with him. And we can only be united with him. We can only, right, become heirs uh, to the hope of eternal life. How, right, um, you know, through the washing of regeneration and the renewing of the Holy Spirit. Um, but, you know, there's the, um, right, here it is, just before that, right? Christ gave himself for us that he might redeem us from every lawless deed and purify for himself his own special people, zealous for good works. We're purified of evil lawlessness and become zealous then for the good works so that we can be united to him. And I think, I mean, fundamentally, why do people see such a division between St. Paul and St. James is because they have a different view of what salvation is in the first place, right? If you have this juridical view of salvation as opposed to an understanding of deification, then it's easy to go in all sorts of weird ways, right? And and now a lot of St. Paul doesn't make sense. St. Paul seems to be conflicting with St. James. But when you understand that the, that what when you understand what salvation is, um, now they're in harmony, right? And it's also because again we as we've talked about before. Um, Pistis, right? Pistevo, I believe, faith, um, is a clinging to, right? It's an active thing. It's not um, an intellectual thing, but it's rather a clinging to it with your whole life, which means also acting on it, right? It's something that you trust. It can be used this way, pistevo, like I trust and rely on. Right? I'm acting in accordance with that. Right? In, in the law, we would call it reasonable reliance. Right? Like I, this is something I know to be true and am acting on reliance, in reliance on that thing. That's beasties. Right? Not just intellectual assent. So would it be greater to say like faith without works isn't faith in the sense that it's... Well, it's not faith at all. Yeah, it's just not faith, right? Faith without works isn't faith, right? Um, which is, I mean, effectively what St. James is saying, right? But it, you're not, you don't believe if you're not acting because that's not faith, um, right? Even the demons believe and tremble, right? I mean, it's sort of, that, that's the point he's getting at. You, they, they know Jesus is God. They know that he's the savior of all human beings. Doesn't save them, <laughs> right? Um, what, what saves them, or what saves us, is acting on that, right? Living that faith. It has to be a living faith. Um, I don't know, yeah. Is some of it the, what the definition of works is, I think, that gets us all. What a, if a well, woman's in a store, drops a can, mm -hmm. canned food, you pick it up for her and hand it to her, mm -hmm. that's works, I would think. Just the, the yeah. fact it's shown faith. I mean, I well, know. yeah, I mean, it's, right, the, the, I mean, it's, um, I was hungry and you fed me, I was thirsty and you gave me drink, I was in prison and you visited me, right, and so on, right? I mean, those are the works. There's also, I mean, you read the gospel, Jesus is telling people to do all sorts of good works, right? right. Alms giving, you know, all sorts of things. I mean, it's, it's shot through. St. Paul brings it up, you know, also. I mean, it's shot through. The whole New Testament is all about the works the Christians are told to do. And we don't do them because, you know, it's a sign that we believe. There are plenty of people who don't believe and do good things, right? That's not the... It's that we are following Christ. We're living in Him, right? And and we can only draw nearer to Him by living, doing the things that He does, right? I mean, mm -hmm. John's Gospel, it even you know, right? It, it, Christ refers to that, right? We are doing the things of God. Right? We can only be united to God if we do the things of God. 
which by the way means that the implication is if we are doing things that are not of God, that we are being united to the demons. Mm-hmm. Yeah, exactly. Um, yeah. Yeah. Which is why also imitation then becomes so important as we saw, right? How do the young men learn to be Christians? By following the example of St. Titus, right? of doing the things that he does. Right? I mean, right, what is, right, when, when St. Paul here is talking about telling him, here's how to teach them how to be good Christians. Sinner's prayer isn't in there. Right. Um, and it's not about make sure to read your Bible every day. Yes, please do read your Bible every day. But, that, you know, but, but what is he teaching them about is, right, sober-mindedness, reverence, temperance, sound faith, love, patience, right, and so on. Right. It's about what they do. It's about what they do. In the same way that we say love is patient, love is kind, right? First Corinthians 13, love isn't a feeling and it's not an idea. It's what you do. If you love me, you will keep my commandments. Which is also, if you have faith, live this way. Do these things, right? Because if you don't, then you don't have faith. This is what faith looks like. Um, I can't, anyway, you, I, I, I may be beating that horse, but I mean, over and over again, you can't make sense of the New Testament really in any other way than to understand that salvation is union with God, and you cannot be united to him without doing the things that he does, which is faith, that is faithfulness. I mean, recall back when we talked about Romans, right? It says Abraham was justified by faith, and what does he cite to as his faith? Him leaving Ur. Right? It's not Abraham sitting in Ur saying, I believe that if I left Ur, God would do this. And God says, well, now you're justified. No, he's not justified until he gets up and walks, right? Um, anyway... Is, um, obedience is part of it. Uh, obedience is certainly part of yeah. it, but I think it grows beyond that, right? If we love him, we will do and the things that pleasure. he does. Right? We do the things that he does. In the same way, um, when I make my wife a cup of coffee in the morning, mm -hmm. right? It, it's go, it goes beyond obedience. I'm doing the things that that she needs. Uh, <laughs> she <laughs> anyway. loves, yeah. yeah. <laughs> loves, needs, etc. Requires. Um. <laughs> anyway, any other questions? The prayers of our Holy Fathers, which is Christ our God, are most necessary. Amen. Thank you. Mm -hmm. As you